Welcome to the G3 Podcast, a weekly podcast focused on the Christian life where we examine doctrinal and cultural issues that impact God's church. My name is Josh Bice, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jeremy Voilo. Jeremy, how are things over in Los Angeles? Going well, Josh. Um, going well, just getting ready for the Shepherds Conference coming up here in just a few weeks now. I know you're coming out for that. It'll be a good time. Um, so things are busy, but good. Yeah, I can't wait to be out there in Los Angeles. It's always a wonderful time. It's my second favorite conference in the <laughs> world. Yes. What's your first? I don't know. I don't know. But <laughs> but it it is. A, it's a wonderful conference. Those that listen to this podcast, if you ever get an opportunity to go to the Shepherds Conference, you need to make sure that you do it. You will not regret it. It is a wonderful, wonderful time. And as we've just now uh, been on the other side of the G3 conference and now uh, back into the rhythm of the G3 podcast, today we're going to talk about a very important subject matter that, well, in some circles it's controversial, but yet at at other times, you know, as we read the Bible, we see words and we see uh, theological terms that can be somewhat difficult to understand. And so today's conversation, we're going to talk about the subject of predestination. So Jeremy, what do you think about predestination? Again, it's a it's a hard subject at times, but nevertheless, it's biblical. And so the, the, the purpose of this conversation today would be just to examine some text and say, what does the Bible actually say? about this doctrine. Yeah, that's good. I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it is clearly a difficult subject. I think it's one we have to all wrestle with, um, just with everything in Scripture. You know, we need to come to Scripture not with preconceived notions and, and seeing how can we fit God's Word into our life, but we really need to come kind of clean slate, so to speak, saying, Lord, how can I submit to what you're teaching? And um, at various points, points that pinches, you know, it pinches our pride, it pinches our flesh, it pinches our desires. And I think predestination is one of those subjects that people obviously wrestle with, have wrestled with throughout church history. It's a good one to wrestle with. We have to, because it's like you said, the word itself is in scripture. And so um, really, I think just coming at it with a desire to allow God's word to shape our understanding of, of what he's saying. Um, and admittedly, I think we all come with some pre preconceived notions. Um, but yeah, just coming to God's word and, and studying it afresh and saying, okay, Lord, what are you teaching us about how you operate specifically in this issue of the salvation of sinners as it regards mm -hmm. predestination? Yeah. So when you're teaching the Bible, you don't typically read a passage and say, now what this actually means as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, when you're teaching people uh, the right way to interpret scripture, you're not suggesting that they should just put their preconceived understanding over the text, maybe as a lens by which they would read the text through. But the job of the one that's interpreting the Bible is always to bring out of the scriptures what the scripture actually means, correct? Yeah. I mean, whether we like it or not, we're all coming to scripture with biases. Right. I mean, we all have preconceived notions, no matter what, just given the circumstances of life or a certain religious framework we, we grew up in. So the job of the teacher, really the job of, of the person reading and studying scripture for the everyday Christian is to first come to an understanding of what the text means before we get to a place where we can ask, what does this text mean for me in my mm -hmm. context? So here we are in mm -hmm. 2020. America, what does this text mean for me? Well, before you answer that, you've got to understand what does that text mean, period? What was its mm -hmm. intent for the original audience given by God through the authors of Scripture? And once we understand the message of that text, and that's what theologically, I mean, that's what the exegesis is, taking out of the text its meaning. Uh, once we exegete, once we're studying the text to understand its meaning. Only then can we come to understand how it bears in our life and what the practical implications are for day-to-day -day Christianity. And, and it's no different with predestination. Um, yeah, absolutely. There are some preconceived notions, and I think, I think certainly some um, people come to the idea of predestination with an aversion 
And Josh, what are some of those aversions that you've dealt with where people even at the thought of predestination immediately kind of kind of get tense and, and want to stiff arm that 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 thinking or that word or those texts because of what? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, typically it, it it centers on an idea of a loss of of control. So uh, people might say, well, I don't I don't think that that's that's fair you know, would, would God do that? You know? And so they'll, they'll describe God as being somehow unfair because he predetermined that certain people would be saved. And so they want to fight against the idea of fairness. And really they're, they're looking at God through an improper lens because we have to remember that God is God and he doesn't play by our rules. He can do whatever he so chooses because he is God. And yet he has chosen to save people in a very specific way. And yes, he does use means by which he brings people to conversion. But what we understand about salvation is that God is in control of it all. And so when when we think about predestination, I think it would be really good for us to read some texts. And then we can come back to some application, maybe at the end and talk about maybe our own personal journey as, as far as coming to these doctrines. But I want to read Romans 8, 29 and 30. And then again, just hear the word. It says this, it says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Again, uh, theologians throughout history have called this text the golden chain of salvation, right? So it's a beautiful passage, but yet twice in these two verses, we hear the word predestined. It's a Greek term. It's a, it's a compound word, pro-oridzo. And literally, it's the, 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 the pro means before and oridzo means to determine. And so it's this idea of like the, the picture here is, is like a sailor being on a boat and the horizon is way off in the distance, and the destination has been marked out before the journey begins. That's the idea of this word. And so from this oridzo, we we derive the English word horizon from. And so it's as if God has marked out the destination of the journey before the journey began. And so that's literally the meaning of the text. Now, again, I, I've, I've heard people when it comes to predestination, they'll say, well, God just, pre- he just predetermined the plan, the overall plan. And then he looked through time to determine who would and who would not reject his son. And based on what he saw, then he predestined those individuals to salvation. Now, when you hear that, Jeremy, what's wrong with that sort of view of God? Well, it opens up a lot of problems. The first, and I think the most blatant, is that of open theism, where you have the God who's not in control of the future. And open theism is the theological error where God is kind of just rolling along in time and responding. And how that that opens up the open theism issue is God is looking forward and he has this power to see in the future, but he's still reacting. He's still responding to what man is ultimately doing. And that's simply not the concept you will find anywhere in Scripture. In fact, I would say the burden of proof for the person who wants to claim that is to demonstrate where that's the, rea- that's the cause in Scripture. Rather, what we're told just immediately after Romans 8, 28, Jacob and Esau is before they had done either good or bad, before they had been born, not because of works, but simply according to God's call, he loved one and hated the other. So right after Paul lays out this this doctrine of God's sovereign eternal predestination, we have the explicit clarification that it's not based on anything they had done. It wasn't a good decision they made or a bad decision they made. It was based purely on the sovereign decree of God who chooses. And so once you have a God who's looking forward into the future and learning things, you no longer have an omniscient, all-powerful, sovereign being. 
but you have a being who's been crafted into the likeness of man, who is having to gain knowledge as time passes. And that opens up serious issue with the character and nature of this God. Absolutely, yes. So again, you mentioned Jacob and Esau, and in the text it says that while they, and and, and even from their mother's womb, right? So the the language is clearly uh, putting before the reader there in Romans 9, the idea that their, their eternal destiny was not based upon their own works. It was not based upon what they could perform or what they could earn. And so God literally predetermined before their birth the fact that he would love Jacob, that he would hate Esau. And so when you hear that, again, that that disturbs people. It, it causes people to think, well, you know, God's not fair. And again, I think that when I read over Romans 9, at least years ago, and I struggled with the doctrine of predestination, I would read over and I would I would try to find a, a commentary that would fit my own interpretive lens that would, you know, say, well, you know, Jacob, God loved Jacob. He just he just loved Esau less, you know, and it was that sort of interpretation. But the fact of the matter is simply this, the more that we study the Bible and the more that we see that predestination is clearly taught in Scripture, again, we return to those verses over the years and you can see, oh, okay, I was, I was reading it in the wrong way. I was reading Romans 9 with this idea that, that, yeah, of course God loves Jacob. That's what God does. God is a God of love. And yet God hates Esau, and I had a hard time with that. Now when I read it, I read it in the opposite way. I'm like, of course God hated Esau. That's what he deserved. But it is amazing that God would actually love Jacob. And then when I start to apply that to my own life and see that God did not owe me anything, and yet God had determined before the foundation of this world to love me is an amazing thing. Yeah, absolutely. And as we wrestle with this issue of predestination, I think it, it needs to be noted exactly what you're you're pointing out there is that the foundation for it needs to be our doctrine, first of all, of the holiness of God and how righteous he is, his standard of perfection, to be in unity and communion and fellowship with him. And that leads us immediately to the reality of our sinfulness and the total depravity of man. And so you see this holy God, you see sinful man, and the question that must be asked is, how could a holy God and sinful man ever dwell together in fellowship, in unity? And truly understanding the nature of our depravity, that we are not victims of our sin. We are moral agents who love our sin. We're in love with our rebellion. We are idol worshipers. We reject the worship of God to worship ourselves and therefore we deserve the wrath of God. And that's the exact image that's painted from Genesis to Revelation, that we as sinners are not victims of some cosmic injustice. We are perpetrators of horrific, horrendous evil against the holy, beautiful, loving God, and we deserve justice. We deserve his wrath. And so when we come to the pages of scripture, when we see that beautiful golden chain of redemption in Romans 8, or we could move over to Ephesians 1 and and just walk through that glorious description of how God actually saves a sinner. And we see that before the foundation of the world, God had predestined me to be ushered into his family, adopted into his family through the sacrificial gospel accomplishment of Jesus Christ. Even though I was his enemy, even though I despised him and hated him and resisted him and was running away from him, headlong toward destruction, he chose me, not based on the merits of my righteousness, not based on the merits of my good deeds, because I had none. In fact, if my salvation was predicated upon good deeds and meriting it, I would never be saved, nor would you, nor would anyone else. But to see that he determined before the foundation of the world to rescue me a rebel against his will leaves me absolutely breathless, humbled at the foot of the cross, praising him for his kindness. Mm. 
Yeah. There's there's a text, Josh, that really encapsulates this as we as we look at the various texts in Scripture. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul walks through his appeal to Gentiles and Jews alike, the Greeks and the Jews, and he's preaching Christ crucified. And he says in verse 20, where's the wise, where's the scribe, where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And listen to these words, for since in the wisdom of God, this is 1 Corinthians 1, 21, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, a folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And then at just a few verses down, verse 26, all the way through the end, over and over, Paul reminds his hearers that it wasn't themselves who ran toward God or chose themselves. He says, consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards or powerful, not many of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak to shame the strong. God chose the low and the despised to bring to nothing things that are. And you go, what is this choice, this sovereign choosing? This is the predestination of a sovereign God. And the implication in verse 29 just comes in so sweetly, so appropriately. 1 Corinthians 1 29, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God this reality of God's sovereign predestination, humbling us, laying low our pride at the foot of the cross as we we see that before the foundation of the world, he has set his love upon us as rebel sinners. You know, another thing that really strikes me as odd in our own contemporary Christian community and circles that we run is this idea that we lead someone to Christ and then some years down the road, we teach them the doctrine of the Trinity. Does that seem odd to you? I mean, if you think about the Great Commission text, the Great Commission text, when you read it, it says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Like, it was the thing to do. You taught the Trinity as a means of teaching them God, as a means of evangelizing people in the first place, so that when you're baptizing them, it's not that they thought, okay, yeah, I asked Jesus into my heart. Jesus saved me. And then they're being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And they're like, hang on a second. So I'm always I'm always surprised when I read that. It's just a, a reminder that we actually need to look at how they taught doctrine from the very beginning. And the reason I mention that is because when you have Peter and John who are there, you know, um, early on in Acts chapter number four, and they're brought before the the council and they're threatened and you have you have these brothers in Acts chapter number four as they're leaving the 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 Sanhedrin there, you have them praying to the Lord and they're praying for boldness. But the interesting thing is is if you go down in that prayer and you pick up in verse 27, they're praying to God and here's what they say in Acts chapter four. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles, the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. In that context, it it just reveals this idea that the disciples had been taught big doctrinal truths like the Trinity and predestination early on. It's not as if they, you know, came to faith in Christ and then it's like seven years later, okay, we're going to just sort of unveil this this doctrine called predestination. They're they're giving a defense for their faith. Their lives are on the line and now they're walking away praying to God and they're in their prayer, they're just talking about predestination. And it's not like, you know, some seminary debate or some dissertation assignment, but this is This is just intimacy, praying out to God, and then you hear them actually praying about God's 
plan of predestination. And it's just, it's just an amazing thing to me. So as you think about predestination, um, and we, we start in Romans 8, and we see that. We see Paul in 1 Corinthians talking about the calling of God and the choosing of God. But what, how are we to react to this? Are we really saying that man has no choice here? God has just determined who's going to be saved, and thus, by default, who's not going to be saved. He's chosen this in eternity past. So what are we doing? What, why are we evangelizing? What is my role personally? Am I just kind of this, this robot functioning, thinking I've got this freedom of decision and, and will, but really everything's been planned out and I can't change my, my fate. So what's, what's to stop this from creating a fatalistic approach to life? God's predestined everything. He's, he's predetermined whether I'll be saved or lost. Um, how, do we, how do we think through that? Um, what many could be thinking is a logical implication of this doctrine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think the answer to the question is that we are merely responding to what God is doing. So do we repent? Yes. Do we believe? Yes. Do we exercise faith? Yes. Um, But why is it that we're doing this? Well, it's because God has predestined us, because God has called us, and, and then again, by the Spirit of God, bringing the gospel uh, in an operative manner within our own hearts, then we are responding. Why? Because God gives us the gift of faith and the gift of repentance. So we are responding to what God is doing. So it's not that we are the prime mover in the whole equation, and then whatever we do, God is reacting to us. It's the other way around. God is always out in front of us. God is always um, ahead of the curve. God has predetermined the destination. God has uh, has ordered the steps in his providence in such a way that we would not only hear the gospel and receive the gospel, but that it would be operative and that it would be effectual in our own hearts and lives. And so we are responding. Now, on this side of the equation, now that we already are saved, what should it cause us to do? Well, first of all, it should cause us to be humble instead of prideful. All right. So anyone that claims that they embrace the doctrine of predestination and they're a prideful jerk, I would say you probably need to read more of the doctrine. You probably need to read more of the scripture because it will affect your pride. It's a pride crusher, actually. And then I think, second of all, it causes us to worship, does it not? It causes us to worship this holy, sovereign God who is massively big and strong and did not owe us anything, mere wretched sinners, and he's chosen to lavish us with his love. Then number three, I think the answer is, what does this doctrine do? Well, it causes me to want to evangelize. Like if I thought that getting people saved was up to me, then I would be so discouraged. I would be like the guy that just decided that he was going to sell insurance. And after about three days of hearing no, 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 at every door that he knocked on, and then he quit, that would be the result for me. If, if I thought that it was just up to me to convince people to exercise their free will and choose God, that's what it would do to me. But predestination causes me to be free and to trust that God will actually save his people. And that's not just a, a nice anecdote you're giving, Josh. That was actually the exact situation the Apostle Paul found himself in. In Acts 18, he had been reasoning with the Jews in the synagogue week in and week out, and they rejected him. And they finally, it's like this vehement rejection of his message, and he shakes out his garments. And he says, fine, you're not going to accept the Messiah. Your blood be on your own heads. And so you've got this dejected Apostle Paul sharing the gospel, and people are not receiving it. And then God actually gives Paul encouragement. Listen to this, Acts 18, verse 9. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, don't be afraid, but go on speaking. Do not be silent. So he's receiving this vehement, even violent opposition this isn't revival. I mean, this isn't like, yeah, I got 60 people saved last night. This is absolute rejection. And Paul, you know, that great man, the the hero of the faith, Paul is discouraged. So God shows up in a vision and says, Paul, keep speaking. 
But here's why. Listen to verse 10. For I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. Yeah. He was sending Paul into pagan Corinth saying, preach, Paul, my sheep are there, mm-hmm. and they will respond. And, yeah. and it's fascinating, isn't it, that we, as we go through Scripture, and notice this, never are the two categories of people in this world, sheep and goats, never are they conflated, never are they mixed. In What I mean is this, never do goats become sheep. Rather, what you find, John chapter 10, is that the sheep who have not yet met Jesus as their Savior are referred to as lost sheep. They're the sheep that haven't yet come into the fold, but when they hear the Messiah's voice, what do they do? They come running. And that's exactly how God himself encouraged Paul So to the point about evangelism and discouragement and predestination, why evangelize if God sovereignly ordained all of this? My question would be, why evangelize if he hasn't? I think Paul would have just packed it up and said, you know what? Forget this gospel ministry. I'm going to go home. I'm going to make tents, I'm going to save money, I'm going to get a wife, I'm going to live on the beach, and I'm going to kick it until the end of my days because I'm tired of getting stoned. I'm tired of getting hated by my people, the Jews and the Gentiles. I'm tired of being poor. I'm tired of being slandered from the church as well as the Judaizers. I'm tired. I'm done. And yet God comes and says, Paul, keep preaching. Why? Because of predestination. Yeah. That's that's really good. Um, so I, I think to sort of bring it full circle, we need to remind everyone that the the actual term itself, predestination, and the doctrine of predestination interwoven throughout Scripture. We see it in numerous places. Uh, Paul writes to the church at Corinth. We see it again in in the the, the preaching of Peter at Pentecost in Acts two. We see uh, Peter in uh, and John, we see them praying to God, talking about predestination. We see it in the letter to the church in Ephesus. We see it uh, to the church in the city of Rome. I mean, it's just all throughout the Bible, right? But here's the thing. John Calvin didn't invent predestination. He did not coin the term. And so where did he, where did he get his doctrine from? Well, he, he got it straight from Scripture. And not just the Apostle Paul, and not just from the apostles that we see uh, recorded there in in Luke's account in Acts, but all throughout the Bible, from Old Testament to New Testament, we see that God's plan is that God has a predetermined, marked out destination for His people, and that in eternity future, every last one that He has predestined will be assembled before him in glory, and not one will be absent on that day. Amen. What a comforting truth that is. And as we sign off here, I would just encourage our listeners as well to dig into what could be perhaps the climactic text on this Ephesians chapter 1, really all of Ephesians, because you see Paul laying this theological foundation of God's sovereignty and salvation in chapter 1 and chapter 2, and then that flows into the glorious blessings and imperatives and commands of of the rest of the book. But Ephesians chapter one, just park there and read and, and sit and study. How is God teaching me how he saved me? What, what is he saying happened in order for me to come to a place where I worship and love and know Jesus as my Lord and savior. And the reality is absolutely staggering. Josh, I know the same is true for you as it was for me. I believed in the sovereignty of God in salvation long before I ever heard the name John Calvin because of how God revealed his character, nature, actions, and attributes on the pages of of Scripture. Mm, Yeah, amen. Well, we hope that this has been an encouragement to you to think through the doctrine of predestination. So uh, again, I, I encourage you to do exactly what Jeremy said. 
just read the Bible, try to understand what the scriptures teach, and remember that God has a plan, and his plan will always be accomplished. And then another thing to remember is that whatever God says in the Bible, don't think that you have to somehow, some way, apologize for God, because God is not ashamed of what he has written in the pages of scripture. Every single doctrine is there, and it's not a mystery, by the way, if it's written down in the scriptures. It is there, unveiled for us to see and to glorify God. And so again, be encouraged, and again, seek to make application to your own life, and it will affect how you worship God as you think through the doctrine of predestination. And then again, we encourage you to Check out g3conference.com. You can find out more about the upcoming conference. Again, find out about the transitions that are in place with the new schedule. We'll be making some announcements about that. But one thing that we would like to invite you to would be the cruise that will be happening next January, where Jeremy and I, along with Vody Bauckham and Phil Johnson, will be teaching and preaching on this cruise. And so you can find out more information about that. And that that, again, that address is g3cruise.com. Dot com. May God bless, and we hope that you will be an active participant within the life of your local church, worshiping and serving God for His glory. <music>